and we are live. Hi, Erica. Hi, Avi. How's it going? It's great. Thanks for joining me uh, for UX on Coffee. Coffee, right here. <laughs> and thank you for really joining me. Uh, the reason I wanted to talk to you, uh, we have actually, this is a new format. Like We're going live on Facebook right now, which means that the people who are watching us can ask questions. I'm monitoring the questions here on the side. So if they have questions as we go along, please ask questions. And I will keep reminding it so people could kind of, um, yeah. So basically, the reason I wanted to talk to you is because I saw recently that you wrote a book, a new book, Conversational Design, which I'm excited to, so it's almost, it's not yet out, right? Yeah, it's out on March 6th. From a book apart. From a book apart, yeah. Great. Very, so, very happy that that's coming out. Uh, so conversational design is a, is, a, is a buzzword I've been hearing a lot in the past. What's that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, what happened? Hey, who's that? <laughs> this is a dog on my lap. This is Rupert. Hey, Rupert. He, just, he always wants to be on my lap during uh, calls. He's cool. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, so, so it's a buzzword I've been, hearing a lot about, design, yeah. I've been hearing a lot about in the last year. And, and uh, it's not just about chatbots. So maybe, I think, right? So tell me a little bit more. What is it, how did you get into this? And uh, what is a conversational design? Well, I first started thinking about the topic about uh, 10 years ago when I did a talk at the Future of Web Apps in London that was about uh, thinking about the language you use as part of your interface. And it was called Copy as Interface. And it was a, a popular talk for a while. And I really thought, that designers need to pay attention to the words because we have such a, a a split. You know, there's like visual designers and then there's writers or content strategists. And the language is really an important part of the interaction. But I, I stepped away from that for a while and I started to focus more on research and I wrote a book about research. And then after, uh, you know, that was out for a while, then, uh, all of a sudden, everybody was talking about uh, conversation, meaning like either chatbots or talking to Alexa. And I thought, well, it, it goes deeper than that. It's not just, you know, talking to your computer or texting your computer. It's really thinking about why conversation is so pleasant between people. And it really is the interface between people yeah, like you, I don't know what's going on in your head. You don't know what's going on in mine, but we can talk very easily, uh, just like we are today. And that's a pleasant and efficient way to exchange information or, uh, or accomplish something together. And so that's a good model for interaction design. But, it, but if you just think about it as, oh, it only works if I talk to my computer, then that fails because uh, we see how limited it is. If you ask Siri or Alexa or Google Home uh, a question that's not sort of on the list of things it can answer, that's a really bad experience. And so it really goes into what makes interactions good and how to think about conversation as a model for all interactive design. So basically the, any interface is a conversation between the user and, uh, right. and, the, and the system, you know, the computer. But people focus too much on the surface, right? They focus on the screens or they focus on the fact that there's a speaker and you're talking to the speaker attached to the computer instead of really thinking, well, how am I trying to help people with this system? And how can I really make it as easy as possible, pleasant as, as talking to another person? Okay, so so but the, so what the, what are the models? How do you like? How do you start even thinking about it? Is if you are if I'm a designer, an interface designer, and uh, I want to shift towards conversational uh, interfaces, what do I do? What's what do I need to know? Well, um, there by, was a uh, the exception of buying your book, of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that's. I mean, that would be the uh, step one in my mind, okay. but it's a. Uh, Reading about, you know, starting by really thinking about how 
language works and learning a little bit about it. And there was a philosopher and a linguist named Paul Grice, and he looked at conversation and analyzed it with the question of what makes it work? Like, how can you just walk up to somebody on the street and as long as you both speak the same language, you can ask that person directions and feel confident that they will give you directions and that they'll probably give you the best directions that they can. Like, how does that even work without uh, explicitly saying, like, do you agree that you won't lie to me and you'll tell me the right thing and you'll tell me if you don't know? There's all of this implicit stuff. And so he analyzed it into uh, the cooperative principle. Like the basic thing that makes conversation work is that you agree uh, to cooperate together towards a goal. And, and that's a great way to think about any design you're doing, any system you're designing is it should feel like it's cooperating with you, the human. And so often it feels like you're fighting, right? It feels like you're, you're fighting the website, like you're fighting to log in or you're fighting to choose the right option on the menu. And it, it's very frustrating. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about it first and foremost, as it should just feel like whatever system or software you're using is on your side and is not your enemy and is cooperating with you and recognizes your goal as a user, that's a great place to start. Even if you don't think about specific language at all, or even if you don't really think about the deep analysis or the philosophy behind it, just think, how can I really make it feel like it's cooperating and not a system I have to fight? But isn't this what we're doing as an interface, as a user experience designers anyway? We want to get the most fluent flow. What is the, what is the shift? What is the shift in my mind when I'm thinking about this? Because it seems to me that we want to create easy to use interfaces and a flow that people understand right away what's happening. Uh, yeah. That... But so many aren't, right? You think like, oh, we know how to do this. And the question is, if, if we are being user centered and we do already know how to do this, why are so many systems terrible? Why? And <laughs> what, 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 what is the, so how does conversational design help here? What, what's, yeah. is there a psychology? Because here? But, yeah. it, it's, it's really thinking about the importance of language because a lot of designers, uh, especially if they come from visual design, they're trained to think about shapes and forms and maybe even interactions, maybe even like behaviors on screen, like animations, and ignore the language, right? I've, I've worked with so many visual designers who said, well, I'll put in lorem ipsum, and then the words will come later. Mm. But the meaning, but the meaning is in the words, right? And there are other things around it, like at even like our conversation, there's a lot of like, I'm making eye contact with you. I can see you look friendly. There are all of these nonverbal parts of an interaction that are important. Mm -hmm. But the way that we understand each other is through language. And I think if you start a design by thinking about, oh, I'm going to make a, a pleasing shape or a nice hierarchy of empty boxes and then fill it in with content, that's backwards. You need to start from what is the meaning that we're exchanging and what is the value? Like if I'm creating a service, like an online service, what is the value I'm giving to you? And start there before you think about mm -hmm. drawing. Because so often in design, you start sketching boxes. Like that's the first place you start. Oh, I'm going to make uh, an app. I'm going to make a, an app for my phone. Oh, I'll start drawing boxes without thinking, oh, what does this really mean? How am I helping somebody? And without even thinking about the device, like you should really think about the interaction before you think about a screen or a speaker or a specific interface. But this is really different. Like people define design as working with an artifact and, and like creating a thing that works in a particular mode. 
Okay. Uh, I want to have, okay, thank you uh, for that. Uh, I want to sh- send a shout out to Edith and Ma- Maria who said hello and thanks for doing this interview. And Rick uh, writes, Team, teams ignore copy and forcing designers to design. Uh, words as well, instead of, of splitting that into two roles into design and copy. Is that a question? Uh, I'm not sure I understand that. Teams ignore copy and forces designers to design words as well, instead of mm-hmm. split, split that into two roles, into design and copy. Okay. So oh, got it. it. So, yeah. So, so it's split. And it is, uh, I think it is really good because it, it's asking a lot for somebody who is a visual designer to also be a very good copywriter. That is asking a lot. But I think it could be really good if you work in pairs. And this is something that like in agile programming, the concept of, of pair programming is really good and popular and kind of talking through the solutions and collaborating. And I think you can do a similar thing if you have somebody maybe who is more of a visual designer or more focused on the, the interface and then have somebody who's more focused on like the verbal meaning and, um, and pair up to work together. That can be something uh, that's one way of doing it. I've also worked with uh, a lot of front end developers who were very good with language. And so it's just a question of uh, making sure that you're thinking holistically, however that works for your team. But the problem is having, you know, quote unquote designers in one place and one part of the project and then content or words or people who think about the meaning in another place and hand things back and forth instead of working together and actually talking, like the best way to do it is sit down and just like everybody talk about what do we think is the best solution to make things really work for our customer Hmm. at the same time in one room. But people don't work like that because they split by discipline. So so maybe the titles, maybe we remove titles and call ourselves, is that maybe their solution to kind of... It could be because uh, right now the titles uh, are are sort of meaningless, right? It, because somebody could have the title, for example, content strategist, and it could mean they are a writer. It could mean they're not a writer at all, and they just think about moving documents around uh, or something around workflow. Uh, if somebody's a designer, it could mean anything. And so I think really starting from like, what's our goal and what do we need to do to achieve that goal and what skills do we need and really focusing on the skills of the team as opposed to one person, like one person can't be a designer like this anymore because the systems are so complicated. It used to be, you know, in the nineties, one person could sit down and say, Oh, I'm going to make a website and they would like design it and code it and write it and just one person. But now we're working on these really complicated systems. And so if we have teams, the teams should work across disciplines. Okay. Uh, a question from Maria. What do you think about user, about chatbot surveys in user research, gathering customer insights? What are the pros and cons and how does it work? Any best practices for examples? How do you get started? <laughs> Wow, that's a, I, I would say it, it really depends because I, um, I've already, I've talked a lot about surveys and surveys are really dangerous because they are really easy. It's really easy to ask questions. Uh, but it's hard to ask the right questions at the right time and actually get useful data back. And so it's not, so I'd say, again, it's not about, whether or not it's a chatbot. It's about what information you get at what time and whether you're asking questions that the user could actually answer. Because a lot of times surveys ask questions that nobody can answer. Like a a question is like, 
how likely are you to buy this product? Like that's a really popular marketing survey question. Nobody can really answer that, right? Because it's asking to predict and people might give an answer they think the company wants to hear like, oh, sure. Yeah, I'll definitely buy that. But that's like that's something you can't ask as a survey. You have to look at how people behave and say, oh, given the things people buy and why they buy them and, and by studying people, then you can say, oh, we think that this group of people is likely to buy our product in this context. So but you could ask a question uh, like, were you able to accomplish what you came here to do? That's a question that somebody could answer on a website. But is, the, if you the just question ask refers, them. because we're speaking about conversational design, refers to chatbots. Is it possible to yeah. have chatbots do research? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, it, if As long as it's, because um, there's nothing special about a chatbot, right? It's just a, a, an interaction, uh, a programmatic data. interaction. Oh. And so there's good ones and, and bad ones, and you could absolutely, um, but you have to be very aware of the limitations, that it, that it wouldn't have the intelligence of a person, and so you'd have to be very careful about when you use it and what questions you'd use. But there's no reason it couldn't be uh, a chatbot essentially interviewing someone. Okay. Uh, That'd be fine. <laughs> ben, ben asks, you share two reasons for, con for conversation, data transfer and shared problem solving. How many goals of co conversations are there? Uh, infinite, right? Because think of, it, it, I think it really helps to visualize like your system just as another person who's helping your customer, who's another person. Like you, me as human beings, we have so many goals and we interact with people and we interact with companies and products to meet those goals, like so many every day. And it's just a question about if you're designing something, mm -hmm. what goals are you there to help with? And I think sometimes people aren't really clear. They just have an idea and say, Oh, I'm going to make an app. I thought I'm making an app without thinking about whether it was really helping with a goal and whether you could make money by helping with the goal, because that's the other side of it. It's not just helping people, it's helping people in a way that gives you a business. Okay, uh, a uh, comment from Maza. Ma Maza, Maza. Uh, content strategies do way more than move documents around and create workflows. <laughs> yeah, some, yeah, absolutely, some of them do. My point wasn't that a content strategist only has a limited job, it was that the title can mean a hundred different yes. things. Okay, so uh, more questions from the audience. Uh, I'm looking for forward to, but uh, so I, I'll ask a question as we wait for more questions. Um, so you you wrote a book. I mean, uh, who is it for? Though who who can you benefit most? Is it everyone who's dealing with design, product design? What's the yeah? Anyone working on any sort of interactive product or service because. Everybody working together has to have the same ideas. And that's when I think design breaks down is when the, uh, the product leader has one idea and the engineer has another idea about how it should work and the designer has another idea and the writer has another idea because they haven't all gotten the same information. And so I'd say you really... Uh, I wrote this book for everybody, for um, for people who write to understand their role and the power they have in helping to create a really human device-independent experience. And it's for people who come from traditional visual or interaction design backgrounds to uh, understand the importance of, of talking to people like on your team and, and the customer before going straight to making a thing. It's for business people to understand uh, whether or not they're making something that has value mm -hmm. and that will get them business value. So it really is for anyone involved in the process. So I feel like it's a, it's conversational design is some, is another tool to have uh, in the process uh, 
So a question from Vitaly, where do you see the regular use cases where conversational design makes sense and when would you avoid it? Um, I would say it's the conversational design I'm talking about, I think you can apply generally. It, and it all depends on what sort of decisions you're making. Uh, because I think you can use the basic principle of cooperation as a sort of check to say, oh, is there anything about our design where we're making it harder for our customer unnecessarily? You can say, oh, are we really uh, using language in a way that's clear and getting the meaning across? And I think most importantly, it's for making sure that you're optimizing for the right things. And one of those things is the, is the speed. Uh, and I think a lot of times, and we really saw this um, in the design of uh, magazines for iPads when the iPad first came out, there was this idea about, oh, if we make this heavy, beautiful design, people will enjoy that. People will want to wait for their information to download so you get a beautiful thing on screen. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants that, right? People want it to be really fast and really easy. And I think that's sort of the promise of eventually being able to talk to an artificial intelligence is to say, oh, it'll be as fast as, um, as talking to another person can be. And we're not quite there yet. So, um, so I really think it is a practice that can be a part of every single part of the design process to say, is this as conversational in, as it could be? But uh, another comment from Vitaly here is that, com that um, convers conversational design, especially when, when you're talking about chatbots, sometimes could be very, very slow when you try to maybe create a, some sort of a builder of something. Uh, yeah. So when, when do you don't use chatbot. <laughs> is there is there a model in there to to do uh, or so don't use it. So there are not. It's limited. By the way, because I'm, yeah. I'm I'm kind of confused still because chatbot is like until like today I thought chatbot is is the core of conversational design. But you're saying it's not quite. Chatbot right. is not just what we're talking about here. It's 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 about a broad sense of interface design. But is it exactly how 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 much chatbot is a part of it? Well, a chatbot can be conversational if it follows the principles, like the deeper principles. But I think a lot of times, uh, especially in the last couple of years, uh, companies have rushed to make chatbots to think, oh, if you text with it, it's easier. And that's why I'm saying the the deeper analysis is that it explains why it's not. Because I think sometimes uh, people who design chatbots are confused because they think, oh, people really like to text each other. We know that, right? People love like texting all the time. People will text and crash their cars because they love texting so much. And so one of the things I talk about in the book is why that experience is so pleasant and fun and why chatbots often miss the mark. And that's because the chatbot isn't getting the r things right about conversation. They get the surface. They get the, oh, there's texts going back and forth. But they don't get what else has to happen to actually make that easy and make that conversational. Um, a, a good example of an interface that is conversational, but people don't think of it, is Google search. Google search does everything that a good conversation does. It takes turns, you know, like you type something, Google responds very quickly. It matches the user's goal really well. And it's also very good at supporting the user if there's a mistake. And I think this is where you see chatbots really fail is if you don't have exactly the right response, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I can't help you. But when you're talking to a person, here's the, the key difference. When you think about a conversation, if, um, if I use the wrong word by mistake, if I misspeak, 
you can probably know what I mean. And that's kind of the core, is either preventing the user from making a mistake or knowing what they actually mean. And that's something that Google search is really good at doing. Because if you type something, and I have an example in the book where I, I type in a, a really misspelled word, but Google is like, oh, here's the results for the right spelling. Hmm. It's interesting you mentioned Google because uh, we are trained already for uh, talking to Google in a very, very square type of way. Mm -hmm. Like you don't, uh, you, don't speak, you don't really type in, like you would, like if you look for an ice cream shop, you would look for, like you would put in a like city and ice cream. You wouldn't yeah. like uh, just, I, where can I find the best? I, that's not the type mm -hmm. of, so it's still lacking a bit of, do uh, you agree or? Uh, of like natural language? Yes, natural language is, is a part. Well, I'd say you think it, it's one of those things like if, um, if you were to, if somebody asked you to like, draw a face, and some people will draw what they think a face looks like in their mind, and then a, a person who's good will draw what they see. And a lot of times learning to draw is breaking that. I think we think our language is more formal than it actually is, right? If you were to transcribe, if you listen to how people talk, uh, a lot of times the, the formality really shifts because you look at like text messages and people can text each other just a few letters or an emoji and be understood. And I think with Google, it's just like, oh, I know how to talk to Google. And it's, it's in a particular style. It's like ice cream shop, San Francisco. And that's still like using your words, but you just know, oh, I don't have to put in the formality, right? I don't have to be polite to Google the way I have to be polite to you because if I just said, Adi, ice cream shop, you'd be like, wow, that's rude. <laughs> so I have to add a few extra words to say, hi, Avi, I, I, can you help me? I'm looking for a good ice cream shop around here. So it really is just like Google doesn't need the extra stuff. It just needs the core. But it goes the other way, too, because if, if you were designing uh, an Alaska, uh, those, uh, those speakers that speak back to you, if they answer in a very rude way, it also will feel like the experience is not that great. So. Right. So it's very context dependent. And I think one of the, the funny things that's happening now is that there's like the Amazon Alexa speaker is in homes with children and parents are very worried that their kids will get rude because their kids will just say, Alexa, play this song. Alexa, do this. Alexa, do that. So I wonder if eventually these companies will add a politeness mode because otherwise we're going to start talking to each other the way we talk to computers. And, we're, and it's going to be super rude. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see some comments here. Google works better. Uh, Adit. Google works better than on voice activation devices. To, to my opinion, it also recognizes mistakes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we've learned. Uh, Carrie says we've learned how to talk to Google, and we don't need the extra words. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, so uh, uh, Edith, Edith asks, does the book describe how to structure conversational design process? Uh, yeah, to a certain extent, at a very high level, um, because because as designers we are very used to thinking about creating artifacts. The process can be very uncomfortable because it really does start by getting, say, your team together and talking things through. And that doesn't feel like design, right? Sitting down at a 30-inch monitor or being on the, the whiteboard, that feels like design. But if you say, okay, let's just talk through what we want to design and and kind of debug the process like that, that doesn't feel like it. So it, it does talk about that, about how to start by, um, you start by actually just really talking to your team members. And you iterate by talking, and then you think, how do we document? If we sit down and kind of talk through, oh, I want to make a system that does this, you can role play, okay, that's great. 
How do we document that? And it could be as simple as just making a recording of your conversation and using that as kind of pseudocode to then design the interaction. Hmm. But that can feel unsatisfying because we were all taught in school, right? We were all taught in school to make very long, when we write papers, they're long. When we make documents, they're very polished. And so the idea that just talking to people is a form of sketching is uncomfortable. And so that's what I tell people is that might be the most effective way to make something really good, but you're going to have to overcome your entire life of education and training. Hmm. Reminds me of a body storming technique in, in, game, in uh, game storming where you create some sort of a box and you speak into the machine. Is that the kind of... Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so um, let's see what else here. What's the most important thing you need to master to create well-designed conversational experiences? Uh, from Vitaly? Um, I would say it's, uh, it's like, it's clarity in your, um, in how you think and how you interact with other people. And a, an important part of it is really interacting with other human beings. And there's a lot of conversation now, especially with everything that's been happening on social media to say, oh, we got the engineering right but we got dealing with people really wrong uh, because there's this division between hard skills and soft skills. And you think, oh, I'm a good designer if I can use Photoshop or Sketch. You know, I'm a good engineer if I'm coding. And now I'm saying you have to also be good at interacting with other people, which could be really uncomfortable. But you can do it in Slack. You know, you don't have to see people face to face. Maybe it's like interacting with other people. But you have to be able to explain I think your ideas with clarity and make sure that you know the, the meaning and the, and the value. And so a big part of it is really being good at that analytic part um, that I think some people might describe as empathy in terms of understanding how human people work, but it's more about uh, understanding that we're all like there's some basic way that we all interact with each other and knowing about that and internalizing that okay uh, thank you erica i think uh, this is uh, our, our i ran out of coffee so i'm <laughs> thinking uh, our time is up i will conclude with one thing from edith that says we are a big fan of design thinking and we appreciate good trans brains brainstorming through conversations thank you we will record it from now on so all right Fantastic. Great. And uh, so I want to thank you again for uh, having the Oh, here's another question here, quickly. How do you design for conversation with different audiences, especially particularly literate adults or teens? Um, it's, it's the same way, but, but I, I'd say you, you really have to start by understanding those audiences. And if you're designing a product uh, for both audiences, you want to understand, because um, I think that's the question, right? Like, how do you design something that serves multiple audiences? I think you really start by uh, being clear about what your role is in terms of your product. Because uh, you can always go and think about, uh, say that you're a, uh, like a, a waiter in a restaurant, right? That's, that's, an, that's like a role that... Uh, a person would interact with both adults and teens, you wouldn't use very different language with them, right? You'd still say, welcome to our restaurant. Um, here are our specials. Can I take your order? Whether they're teens or whether they're adults. And so I think in many cases, uh, there's a lot more similarity than there is difference. And I think because people expect there to be more difference, uh, then they'll um, then they'll try to say like oh we have to use like you see these mistakes all the time where it's like oh we have a product for teens so we're going to use teen lingo and it sounds really dumb hmm. but you just have to make sure like oh is my product something a teen would value and so to use the restaurant metaphor it's like well if you're McDonald's you'll probably get a lot more teens as opposed to a fancy restaurant. So you think like, do I have a fancy restaurant or do I have McDonald's? But you have to start with 
what you're offering and which audiences really want what you're selling. Oh, okay. That's very fascinating. So uh, I'm going to conclude here by saying that the conversational design uh, book is coming out soon and uh, from a book apart. So if, mm -hmm. if you guys look interested, go to a book apart and like pre-order it. And another public announcement, you can see UX Salon here. That, uh, that's like the website. That, there's a conference in May, May 6th and 7th in Tel Aviv. So if people want to come, you're welcome to come to this big, great conference that I'm organizing here. Uh, Eric, I was a speaker, uh, I think, two years ago, yeah. right? So uh, Yeah, wow. I had, yeah, I had a great time. It was a really, really good conference. So I recommend it. <laughs> oh, thank you. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, I'll see you again at UX and Coffee next month. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.